Okay, and we are starting the uh, aspects of the War of 1812. Uh, we're going to look at how America got involved in the war, the highlights of the war, and what the the legacy of the war is. Essentially, what it leads, uh, what it leaves America with when it's all said and done. Uh, I want you to keep in mind, staying in line with our basic themes and what our themes were that we decided on. Um, the War of 1812 is going to match very nicely with this idea of American identity. So. Uh, Let's try to keep that in mind as we're rolling through these notes. Now, some major events that led to the War of 1812 was um, obviously we had this issue with shipping. Uh, the United States was coming on the world scene as far as trade goes, and our shipping was being harassed and cargo was being seized. This is because uh, Great Britain was in a war with France or Napoleon, and we were trading to both sides. So Britain is trying to blockade Europe off and blockade France off from the rest of the world, but we continue to trade. So Britain's going to do things like require licenses for ships to go to Europe, and France is going to confiscate cargo from those licensed ships, so it's just a play back and forth. Impressment is going to be the biggest issue, which is going to draw us into the War of 1812, and we'll see that again. But it's essentially where the British Navy is kidnapping U.S. sailors off American ships um, and made them join the British Navy. Uh, so keep in mind, when we're talking about American identity, what is a citizen, and how do we define an American citizen? And then another reason uh, is that the British are inciting Indian hostilities. They're giving weapons to the Indians, which is, does not sit well with a lot of American congressmen. Uh, chief amongst these is the uh, Shawnee Indian by the name of Tecumseh, who is going to fight Americans with British aid. Now, some of the ways that we try to combat this uh, economic policy that Britain was engaging in, this trade policy, was to cut off trade completely. So we initiated the Embargo Act in 1807, and this was something that old uh, Thomas Jefferson would have done. Now keep in mind, Thomas Jefferson, he's got that other vision of America, the land vision, everybody's a farmer. He's not a Federalist, he's not from New England, so he doesn't have, he doesn't see the importance of trade. So him cutting off trade by not saying, we're not going to ship to anybody else, we're going to become total isolationists, you know, it's whatever. And to a lot of Southerners that are farmers, they don't care either. But you can imagine to people in the North, who were uh, engaged in port cities or heavily involved in any kind of trade, this was a massive turnoff and it really uh, irritated them. Now I guess you could say like the crux of the situation is what's going on in Europe. I mean if you look here everything in this dark green color is basically the French Empire. Everything in the light green is what Napoleon in France controls and everything in the purple is countries or are countries that are allied with, uh, with Napoleon and with France. Countries in orange are the ones opposing him. Uh, essentially, this is what's going on. Great Britain versus Napoleon. It's in America, essentially, because of our trade, is we're just stuck in the middle being pulled at from both sides. All right? Now, to go a little bit deeper into the issue of impressment, this is the number one issue cited as for the reasons that we are going to declare war against Great Britain. Uh, British merchants with the British Navy are seizing our ships and they're coming on board our ships, which is a huge problem for a lot of Americans. And they're taking people that have a British ass accent, so to speak, back to the British Navy. Uh, the British, while fighting their war with Napoleon, they're losing manpower. Manpower is an issue. Uh, many of them are dying, but something like 10 to 15,000 of them are actually deserting from the British Navy every year. So the British have to make up that manpower and the way that they see to do it is through impressment. So they seize the ships and they take citizens off of it that are British subjects because according to the British once a subject always a subject. It just so happens that they're actually going to catch a lot of actual natural born Americans in the process as well. The most famous of the impressment issues is the Chesapeake Leopard incident. Uh, you have the USS Chesapeake and the HMS Leopard and the Leopard is going to demand that the Chesapeake allow their officers to come on board to check for those deserters so that they can impress them. The Chesapeake refuses and the Leopard fires upon the Chesapeake, kills several men, boards anyway, and takes four men for impressment. Now although this just seems like another case of impressment, the reason this specific event is special is because it happens very, very close to the American shoreline. It's like watching it on TV for a lot of Americans. It's up close and personal. They can see it. Once more, the Leopard, and by connection the British, have attacked us in our own waters. And that's basically a, uh, an act of war. 
uh, that warrants some type of response. So you can see this is kind of a pivotal and uh, pivotal encounter here, and it kind of gives a big symbolic representation of impressment overall. Now, after two terms as president, Jefferson Thomas Jefferson is going to step down, uh, and his you know, basically his right-hand man in politics, James Madison, is going to come into office. He's going to be over. He's going to be elected uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, he had experience before as as Jefferson's Secretary of State. He was an author of 30 of the 81 Federalist Papers, including these two specific. He's considered the most important contributor to the Constitution, and he's one of the shortest presidents, standing at about five four. Uh, they used to refer to him as Little Jimmy or the Pygmy. However, believe me, for what Madison lacks in height, he gains in intelligence. Now, Madison's also going to uh, go towards a, a certain course of action. Keep in mind, Madison's got that same view of America as, uh, as Jefferson does, and he's going to engage in sidestepping trade as well and trying to pressure France and England into getting along with us by, by cutting off our trade. He institutes the Non-Intercourse Act, which forbids trade with France and Britain. However, the, the difference between this one and the Embargo Act is that there was a clause that said when, okay, big emphasis on when, when either France or Britain lifted the restrictions, then we would renew trade with them. So the outlet was always open. Also in the South, you have the inclusion of the War Hawks, uh, people such as John C. Calhoun, who's going to be uh, pretty important later for us when we talk about nullification. But they are calling for war. Keep in mind who these congressmen are and what their political alliance is. Most of them are Republicans at this time or Democratic Republicans, if you, if you prefer to call them that. They don't ally with the uh, Federalist and British friend idea. They don't hold those, those sympathies towards the British dear to them like a lot of the Federalists did. They're, it's, a, it's a political faction. It's political division that's going on in America, which is why you have one party promoting this concept of war and another party not. Now on the frontier up around the uh, what you would call Indiana at the time this is pretty much just Indian territory and two famous Indians that are up there at the time is Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa and yes they are related. Tecumseh is a Shawnee war chief who is trying to unite the tribes to resist American expansion because Manifest Destiny even though the term has not started yet or even though the term has not been created yet it's essentially already started. Americans are expanding. Now his brother, the prophet Tenskwatawa, is also a uh, pretty influential individual for the Shawnee. Not as influential as Tecumseh, but he's there nonetheless, and he's actually involved in one of the early battles. All right? But because these Indians are out there and they're allying, they have to face off against a, a pretty prominent American figure, uh, William Henry Harrison, who I'll write his name down there. He is essentially the governor out here in the Indian Territory, and he's guiding along this American expansion. They're going to run into each other at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Uh, General William Henry Harrison is going to run into Tenskwatawa. Uh, excuse me, Tecumseh was actually out recruiting more Indians to join up in this Indian Confederation to resist the white man. Uh, so Tenskwatawa is left in charge. Tenskwatawa actually attacks Harrison as he's getting there. Harrison's men are going to kind of take the day, and they're going to burn Prophetstown, their goal, what they were trying to take that Indian neighborhood. They're going to burn Prophetstown to the ground. But they discovered that these Indians that they had been facing, these Shawnee, were using British weapons. So it would appear that the British were actually actively trying to incite Indians to fight on the frontier. Now it's at this point, and because of the Chesapeake Leopard, and because of the issues of impressment, that America is going to see that the right thing to do is to declare war. Now, there are some benefits for Amer of America going to war at this time. Like, to settle war would be to reopen trade. Once it's all said and done, trade can reopen. You've also got this aspect of national pride. People are tired of being harassed, and they're tired of being impressed, which is one of the other issues, one of the benefits of going to war, because impressment of sailors was starting to infringe on our natural rights. And that's how a lot of Americans saw this. A lot of Americans saw this as continuing the revolution and making sure that England doesn't try to take it back. And then one of the other benefits is, of course, Canada. Uh, we can take Canada from the British and unite it and have a massive, free American uh, nation. But there are plenty of downsides to going to war as well. Uh, not everyone in the U.S. wanted to go to war. Keep in mind, we've got Federalists pinned against Republicans. 
and our military is small because we have a huge emphasis on militia. A large military was counterproductive to a nation that was supposed to have liberty. So our army was always kept small. Our militia was comprised our militia comprised most of our forces, but they did not like to fight outside of their own state borders. They had an allegiance to their state. Not only that, they were horrible soldiers and they'd get together maybe once a month just to talk about things and go down to the tavern. Our navy, as far as military goes, is quite small. Only 22 ships. It's actually gunships, too, which are even smaller. They're not ship of the line. But we have a massive merchant fleet, huge merchant fleet, uh, which you do need to take note of. Because uh, one of the things America is going to do is actually use that merchant fleet to act sort of as pirates. And these guys are going to raid the, uh, the British coastline. Britain, however, at this time is a world superpower, and they could defeat us. They've got the biggest military navy in the world, and they have trained professional soldiers. We could lose territory. We could lose territory that we gained in the Treaty of Paris in the Revolution or the Louisiana Purchase. Another thing we could lose is our independence, so we don't need to lose sight of that. On June of 1812, Madison is going to ask Congress for a declaration of war. The vote is going to be split along regional lines, north and south, and I guess you could also argue amongst political lines as well. Keep in mind, the Federalists in the north, they don't want to lose that trade with Britain. America is going to start off this war with an invasion of Canada, and you can kind of see over here these lines of our attack routes going into Detroit. And But early on, we're going to have just horrendous failures as we're trying to invade into Canada. Uh, a lot of the militia will not cross the line. They won't go out of the states. Uh, we're going to lose Detroit. We're going to surrender Detroit at one point, which is a massive drawback. Some key battles to kind of look at before we move on is that the United States is actually going to march into Canada at one point. It's going to go into York, which is now Toronto. Uh, and they're going to burn it. They're going to burn the parliamentary building in York. Uh, the U.S. figured the Canadians at first would actually welcome the Americans and quickly join the United States to expel the British from North America, and it would all be, you know, liberty and enlightenment ideas and great for everyone. But that's not what happened. And then the Americans get there, poorly trained soldiers, they end up burning the place to the ground. Perry is going to pick up a huge victory on Lake Erie, a massive naval victory where he's going to have his uh, trademark flag flying, uh, don't give up the ship. which I've actually got a copy of that flag, and we're going to see in class, so that ought to be pretty interesting. Uh, and Britain, some of the stuff that they're going to do is they're actually going to blockade the eastern seaboard to prevent shipping from leaving. It's going to make the war very unpopular in the northeast. And remember what is in the northeast and who is involved in that shipping. For the most part, it's Federalist, uh, which kind of goes back into some of those notions of American individualism because it's going to be Federalists that row, row boats out to the British blockade and sell them goods to make money. And here's a more extensive map of the uh, the northern campaigns. Uh, Harrison is actually going to start to really give people a what for. Here's the Battle of Lake Erie right here in this area. Uh, Perry's going to pick up a huge victory right here. And coinciding with that huge victory, Harrison, William Henry Harrison, who defeats the Shawnee, is going to push hard into Canada. And he's actually going to have a huge significant battle at the Battle of the Thames right in this area here. Now, in August of 1814, the British are actually going to invade. The Napoleonic Wars, for the most part, are over, which means they can focus resources towards America. These British, force, these British forces are going to sail into the Chesapeake Bay, and they're going to capture and then burn Washington, D.C. They burn the White House to the ground. Uh, keep in mind, York. And there's actually some terrific stories of the, the uh, burning of D.C., such as the President's wife, Dolly Madison, being one of the last to leave and her taking the White House silverware, and the portrait of George Washington out of the White House as she's fleeing to get away. So there are some, there is some uh, romantic uh, stories, some rom a little bit of romanticism that goes along with the burning of D.C., but for the most part, a lot of Americans don't seem to remember that the White House actually was ever burned down. Now, the main goal, the reason that they were actually in the Chesapeake anyway, was Baltimore. At the time, Washington, D.C. was a little more than just a start-up town. It wasn't really that important. It was just kind of symbolic. The British really wanted Baltimore, a huge trade city with a lot of ships and a lot of money. 
Now, the city militia this time had been there for a long time. They were more prepared, and they had trenches, and they had a fort. And because they're so prepared, and they've got all this time to wait on the British and to get things ready, the city militia is going to inflict huge casualties on the British. Uh, the British are going to bombard Fort McHenry, which is at the mouth of the harbor going into Baltimore on September 13th, 1814. But after it doesn't work out, they're going to abandon the attack. And this is where we get our national anthem from. Francis Scott Key, who is on board one of the British ships out in the harbor negotiating a prisoner exchange, is going to see this bombardment, and the next morning is going to pin the poem, um, which is the bombardment of Fort Henry, which becomes the national anthem. The O Say Can You See by the Dawn's Early Light. And all the phrases that go into that poem is actually descriptions of the battle that he saw. Now, as the war went on and on, and it just became even more of a stalemate, uh, the treaty, of, again, is eventually going to be signed. The treaty is going to be negotiated in Europe. It's going to be signed December 24th, 1814. It's going to end the War of 1812 officially. The war ends in a stalemate. No one wins or no one loses. They go back to a pre-war uh, status quo, which means everybody goes back to their individual lines, all bets are off, and oddly enough, in the treaty again, uh, treaty again, the issue of impressment was not addressed. The issue just kind of fades on its own over time. But the treaty of Ghent does not actually end the War of 1812. Its most famous battle happens after the treaty has been signed. The Battle of New Orleans. It's fought after the treaty was signed. It wasn't ratified by Congress yet. But this battle specifically makes Andrew Jackson a national hero and a household name. Uh, essentially what happens is the Americans go down and they fight in a huge conflict with the British around the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. And they build massive trench works to protect the harbor and protect the city. And the British march wave after wave after wave. These are Napoleonic soldiers. And the Americans behind their, the trenches just cut them down. It's a one-sided victory. Um, when this happens, you can imagine, like, the treaty rolls in, it's on its way to Washington, D.C., but before it can get there, it hits the headlines that we just won a huge, or America just won a huge battle in the Battle of New Orleans. And then a few days later, it gets in the headlines that the treaty again has been signed. So America really goes out of this on a high note. But America learns a few things from this war. Uh, this essentially gives America a national identity. Because of the War of 1812, nationalism is born. People feel good about being an American because they fought the British, the most powerful empire in the world that had just defeated Napoleon, and we held our own. We fought them to a draw. And then this idea of expansion, this Western expansion, is going to continue to take place. The Indians are gone. The British cannot stop us, which is going to lead into our manifest destiny. And over time, you're going to see that these embedded bad feelings towards the British are eventually going to start to uh, disappear, and they're going to become our major allies. Uh, one thing that the war also does is it creates national heroes, such as Andrew Jackson, the Western frontiersman, Henry Harrison. Okay, These guys are not British. They're not founding fathers. They don't have a connection to Britain. They were born in America. They are American. They speak like Americans. They are true American heroes, which goes back into our concept of nationalism that I said earlier, Okay, because these guys become symbols of nationalism. All right, and this ends the notes of the War of 1812. Um, remember to look over these and study these. we got a quiz coming up soon.